We believe that museums make the world better and that AAM makes museums better. I believe they can change the world and that every person who engages with a museum can find the way that they can change the world. Museums are for lifelong learning and uh, there's something in a museum for everyone. The great discovery of museums for me was this idea that, that you learn by choice and not by obligation. And strictly because I was able to go with school trips to museums, I grew my entire interest in art history. So as a teacher, uh, I always really looked hard for ways to integrate museum learning and out of the classroom learning with my students. So when I told them, okay, you should, you should come, like, grab my hand, come inside with me, they were, they had this look, like, amazement, like, oh, this is so huge, this is so wonderful, and I told them, and we can go inside the rooms and we can see art and we can see paintings. We have a responsibility and obligation to our communities to not just be the keeper of their objects, but also to lift up the stories from our communities. Museums serve as a, a space where community histories are preserved, um, where community histories are living today. They take care of uh, heritages, so I think museums are really important because if we do not have museums, there's no heritage, there's no history to talk about. So the public trusts us to tell the truth. We, we've got a real responsibility to the public to help educate, to help provide information, to help provide a safe place to talk about the issues of our culture. But it's in that museum that I found solace, that I found comfort. Whether it's, you know, kind of a, a museum of technology, uh, a museum of natural history, a museum of American history or something like that, you step out of the bubble that you've kind of created around yourself and thrust yourself into a world that has existed might exist in the future, and it just uh, awakens your soul, it awakens your mind in ways that you don't find anywhere else. Welcome to the AAM Virtual Annual Meeting and Museum Expo. We would like to thank our signature sponsor, Microsoft, for their generous support of this program. Now please welcome Laura Lott, President and CEO of AAM. Hello, and welcome to the first ever virtual AAM Annual Meeting and Museum Expo. To the thousands of you watching and participating from around the United States and from around the world, I know this isn't what we hoped for. Just two months ago, we were putting the finishing touches on fantastic plans for our in-person meeting in San Francisco. The local host committee worked so hard to welcome us to the amazing institutions in the Bay Area, the Oakland Museum, the Computer History Museum, the Exploratorium, the Asian Art Museum, and so many others. But the coronavirus had other plans for our annual meeting, for the museum field, for the dedicated museum staffs, and for our world. Like many of you, I suspect I have spent a lot of time lately feeling angry, scared, and just sad about all that is happening. Each one of us has been affected by the pandemic and is suffering some sense of loss. For those participating today who have battled this virus or know someone who has lost the battle to COVID-19, our thoughts are with you. To the caregivers, first responders, grocery store employees, and others who risk their lives every day for our communities, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Not a day goes by when I don't think about all the people who are hurting and struggling in the American Alliance of Museums community. Because nearly every institution remains closed, thousands of museum colleagues are out of work. The AAM team is doing everything in our power to get you back to work as quickly and safely as possible. Among the emotions I shared earlier, it's important that I share a few more. 
I'm also grateful, inspired, and hopeful. I am hopeful that the museum field is going to lead the way in our world's recovery and healing. I am inspired by how museums are already leading that recovery and serving new needs in our communities. Even though museums are closed, many are still providing educational programming and resources to one and a half billion school children around the globe affected by school closures. Museums are emptying their own closets and donating safety supplies and equipment to local hospitals. Their doors may be closed, but you just cannot stop museums from providing opportunities for joy, solace, and inspiration when people need it most. And I am grateful that the amazing staff of the American Alliance of Museums is healthy and strong, and that our team pivoted in a matter of hours to a virtual office, producing new content, advocating, and bringing our hurt community together. I am grateful to our professional networks and presenters who are giving their time and expertise during the virtual conference and in dozens of free webinars and resources. I am grateful to our board and generous supporters who realize that AAM cannot close down, cannot miss a beat. We need to fight for museums and support the people that make up museums now more than ever. Like most of our members, AAM is a nonprofit 501c3 organization. Like most of our members, AAM's revenue comes from membership dues, donations, and event revenue, including our annual meeting and expo. Like most of our members, we use that revenue to provide year-round programming and advocacy for our community. And in AAM's case, our community is you. At the same time, museum leaders are working through contingencies and models for reopening institutions in a new world. We are doing the same thing here at AAM. Those models right now include less revenue and more expenses. In the months to come, we may slow some Alliance initiatives, but let me be crystal clear. We will never stop our work to champion museums and nurture excellence. AAM was founded 114 years ago and has survived previous pandemics, world wars, and vicious political attempts to shut down arts and culture in our country. We are doing everything we can to guarantee that our alliance and our museums will be here for another 114 years. During this once in a generation crisis, a strong alliance is crucial. I want to take just a few minutes to share a bit about our plans to lead our field's recovery, our own Museum CARES Act, if you will, C, A, R, E, and S. C is for content and communication and connection. For decades, AAM has been a leader in providing you trustworthy information and in connecting people across the sector, from art museums and aquariums to science centers and zoos. We take that responsibility very seriously. In any crisis, especially one of this magnitude where there is no playbook, we all need high quality, rapid response, thoughtful information to guide our decisions. At every stage of this crisis, the AAM team has been laser focused on sharing resources, data, and examples from across the field to inform your decisions. And we moved quickly to make sure you could connect with each other on a variety of platforms, including this virtual conference. We all have a thirst for news and information. There is record traffic visiting our website during the pandemic. Governors and local leaders around the country are using the Alliance's guidelines and resources to plan for the reopening of museums and other cultural institutions safely. Thousands are participating in our free webinars and more than 2000 museum professionals are participating in this virtual conference. But here's the secret to the C. Our digital library and toolkits and virtual forums are empty without contributions from you. Alliance members have stepped up to the challenge and shared articles, data, and resources like never before. So thank you, and please keep the content coming. Many in our field are relying on your valuable information, lessons learned, and inspiring examples of success. The A is for advocacy. When the world shut down in March and Congress started working on a relief package for the country, I was optimistic and determined to make sure museums' needs were heard and addressed. My optimism came from the fact that the museum field has some of the strongest advocates anywhere with important stories from diverse communities. 
As recently as February, during Museum's Advocacy Day, hundreds of you came to Washington, D.C. and stormed Capitol Hill to share your museum stories and our field's $50 billion economic impact with lawmakers. And in recent weeks, museum advocates sent over 40,000 messages to Congress using the Alliance's online advocacy tools. What was the payoff for that hard work? More than $200 million in financial relief earmarked for the cultural agencies, eligibility for small business loans to protect museum jobs, and increased charitable giving incentives, among other successes. I know it's not nearly enough, but it wasn't that long ago that museums and zoos and aquariums were left out of congressional stimulus funding entirely. The US Senate actually voted to ban museums from receiving any funding in the 2009 stimulus package. So from being left out 10 years ago to millions of dollars in 2020, our advocacy is working. And we are certainly not done yet. We will keep fighting for additional funding for museums of all types and sizes in the next rounds of relief funding and as Congress turns its attention to the annual appropriations process. So please keep responding to our advocacy alerts, keep writing those letters and making your phone calls to your legislators and engage your trustees and communities in telling leaders how important your museum is to them. Your voice matters. The R in our CARES acronym is for reimagine. It's clear that how we choose to move through the impacts of the pandemic will determine the future of our museums for years to come. As others have put it, in the midst of much uncertainty, one thing is clear. The museums we closed will not be the museums we reopen. I urge us to embrace that reality, difficult as it is right now, and use this disruption to address many of the structures that have not served us from precarious business models to the inequities embedded into how we work. We need new models to be successful, relevant, and inclusive in the future. Now is the time to dismantle the old and rebuild a new, rebuild a better museum field. And so the E is for equity. It was just about this time a year ago when I shared details of our Facing Change initiative to diversify museum boards and leadership. Thanks to investments by the Ford, Mellon, and Alice Walton Foundations, the Alliance held a dozen workshops with over 1,000 board members from 56 participating museums last year. Inclusion work at this scale has never been attempted before in our field, and we were overwhelmed and grateful for the support and enthusiastic participation. When the pandemic hit and museums focus shifted to survival, I anticipated our Facing Change participants might want to pause our work on diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. But the response was the opposite. The majority of museums recognized the importance of this work now more than ever and asked to continue. So while some elements of the plan will slow and change to address the current situation, the important work of Facing Change continues. During this pandemic and global crisis, it is more important than ever to acknowledge that it is our diversity, the variety of voices and perspectives we bring to the table that makes us strong. As museums rise to the challenge of COVID-19 and make impossibly difficult decisions, we have a great responsibility to stay focused on equity. The pandemic has amplified many of the inequities in our society and our field is no different. Now is not the time to push these DEAI initiatives aside. Now is the time to double down on them, to center equity in our decision-making and actions, and to lift up those most vulnerable in our institutions and in our communities. Lastly, the S is for support. This is a highly stressful, emotional time for all of us. Each of us is struggling in our own way and facing our own personal challenges. Hopefully, we each also know how good it feels when someone extends some kindness, some compassion, a message of encouragement. It can mean everything to just hear a few words of support. We cannot control or change everything that's going on in our world, but we do each have the power to bring light and empathy to our fellow human beings and to our colleagues in this museum field. In the coming days, I urge you to support each other, be kind to each other, check in on your colleagues and really practice empathy and patience. That will make us all stronger. I wanna close by reiterating my gratitude to all of you. 
on this International Museum Day. Thank you to all our participants and presenters from around the world. Our museum field is connected like never before, and it will take cross-continental solidarity, leadership, and cooperation to tackle this worldwide crisis and emerge a stronger global museum field. To our Museum Expo participants and sponsors, and especially today's signature sponsor, Microsoft, thank you. As each of you deal with this crisis and wonder what your future looks like, you never turned your back on the museum field, nor on AAM. We will all remember how you stood by us during this crisis, and we will all succeed together in the years to come. And thank you to the presenters who we hear from during the five days of the virtual conference. We are so lucky to have experts and thought leaders from within the museum field, as well as some outside voices. They are joining us to provide perspective, ideas, and inspiration to help us reimagine our institutions. Despite a lot of uncertainty in the world and the challenges we face, I am hopeful. In addition to all the serious conversations we'll have together in the coming days, we at the Alliance also wanted to bring you some moments of joy. You are here because you are leaders, you are resilient, and you are vital to our society's recovery and healing. There is no Alliance without you. Indeed, history has its eyes on you. Hello everyone, my name is Tamar Green and I play the role of George Washington in the Broadway Company of Hamilton. So this message comes from Laura Lott to all you museum workers, curators and historians alike. I am here to send you some love and some light. I know that you all have been shut down like us on Broadway since around March. Um, and that is a bummer, right? But I mean, museums are incredibly important. This comes from Laura directly, actually, but I really concur with this. Without museums, there is no conversation. There is no education, inspiration, or community support. Museums are so important. Both museums and libraries are where knowledge is, right? We have to know our history to do better in the future. Um, and obviously there is no Hamilton without the study of the past and where we've come from. So I want to thank you all for the career that you all have in the journey that you all have been on, uh, taking part in maintaining, uh, uh the perseverance of, of such, uh, great tales and such. So because history, right? Because you all love history so much, I want to do one of my favorite parts of the show, which is history. Let me tell you what I wish I'd known when I was young and dreamed of glory. You have no control who lives, who dies, who tells your story. I know that we can win. I know that greatness lies in you, but remember from here on in, history has its eyes on you. Peace and love to you all. Take care of yourselves. In these crazy times, take care of your family. Peace and love. Cheers. Please welcome Dr. Janetta B. Cole, President and National Chair of the National Council of Negro Women Incorporated and Special Counsel on Strategic Initiatives at the Baltimore Museum of Art. My AAM sisters and brothers, my siblings all, I am sending each of you a virtual hug. And I'm doing so as I welcome you to the kickoff of our 2020 virtual meetings. And you are my kinfolks. No, not by blood or marriage, but because we share certain interests, values, and dreams. We all love museums. We value how museums have the power to take us to different places, ignite a range of emotions, 
and pose some of life's most persistent and urgent questions. And yes, we value how museums are full of the magic of human creativity. I hope you are with me in also valuing how museums can help us learn about different ways of being, and they can help us understand the universality of our shared condition. During these intensely challenging times, as we struggle with the multiple ways that the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting so much of what we used to do, where we used to go, even what we used to think about. I know that you, like I, dream of returning to the best of what used to be. But I want you to join me in also dreaming that when this pandemic is no more, we human beings will be better. We will be wiser. We will be kinder and more committed to respecting the diversity among us, to achieving equity, to guaranteeing accessibility for all and creating spaces that are valued because they are inclusive of all of us. As you know, the theme of our virtual meetings is radical reimagining. Today is also International Museum Day with the theme of Museums for Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion. I can't think of two more important themes for us to focus on at this time. Now, I want to give a special shout out to our international members. And a shout out as well to colleagues who work in aquariums, zoos, botanical gardens, arboretums, historic sites, science and technology centers. My kin folks, I know that these are truly tough times for museums and for all of us museum professionals. Across our country and in much of the world, most museums are still closed. Thousands of museum professionals are furloughed or worse, have lost their jobs. During our virtual conference, we've got to figure out how to use the resilient power of the arts to help our communities pull through this worst health crisis since the pandemic of 1918. And we must also give attention to how we as museum professionals can reposition and reorient our museums and ourselves. Reorient reposition ourselves in our museums to create new pathways forward for the betterment of our field and of course our global community. Yes, the period we are in is difficult. It is full of trouble. But as an old song says, a song that comes out of the black community Trouble don't last always. I applaud, I affirm, I champion the theme of this year's meetings, radical imagining. That is exactly what we need now more than ever. When times are scary, when we're not sure what the next day will bring or how we're going to get through a crisis, it's so tempting to do what is safe, to engage in easy responses, to fall back on old and tried ways of doing things, to lean into the way we have always done something. 
but my sisters and brothers, my siblings all. I am convinced that the difficult times that we are in require the very opposite of doing what is safe, what is easy, what we have always done. When I think about the four foci of our organization, it's clear to me that this is a time when we must not only carry on with our emphasis on financial stability, on education, on diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion, we must do so in radical and highly imaginative ways. Indeed, it's in these challenges, in, in these challenging times that we surely need to break out of established ways of doing things and look at doing things in different ways. I know it's not easy, but I'll tell you this, the place that we're in at this moment in time requires that we let go of certainty and that we grab a hold of creativity. Creativity requires courage, boldness, and action. And as my Shiro, Maya Angelou has said, you can't use up creativity. The more you use, the more you have. It said that the economic slump caused by the coronavirus is the worst since the Great Depression. Once our economy does rebound, we cannot count on the pre-existing ways that resources were acquired to establish financial stability for our museums. We have to reimagine what fiscal stability looks like, how museums can diversify their revenue sources, and how we can assure that all of our institutions are indispensable and worth supporting. If we do all of that, when the next crisis hits, and I do believe we got to imagine that there will be another crisis, our museums will be stronger and more resilient than ever before. This pandemic has not only disrupted our economy, it has upended our education system, leading to the near total closure of schools, colleges, and universities. And in terms of our museums, social distancing and other guidelines that were required during this pandemic brought to a halt the kind of in-person, imaginative, hands-on education that has characterized museum education programs. Just as schools, colleges, and universities have been challenged to find alternative ways for teaching and learning, so must you, dear museum educators. Whenever that day comes, when we can have educational programs again in our museums. The question is, will we go back to the same old ways that we've always done things? Or will we courageously and bodaciously engage in new and different ways of presenting ideas and posing questions that are raised by the artworks exhibited in our museums. Of course, the way we have always presented exhibitions has been fundamentally challenged by the health crisis that is still with us. When this crisis is over, will we return to the ways that we usually present exhibitions? Or will we allow our creativity, our imagination, to come up with radically new ways of telling the stories 
that are waiting to be told. Stories waiting to be told by the works in our collections. Will we dare to accept the challenge that is tucked inside of this statement by Albert Einstein? If at first the idea is not absurd, then there is no hope for it. My dear Ken folks, as we move through and hopefully, hopefully soon come to a point beyond this dreadful pandemic, what should we be doing about our stated commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion? Of the three foci in our Alliance's strategic plan, this is probably the one that many in our museum community would argue we should, you know, just put on the back burner. After all, of the three tasks that we have assigned to ourselves, it is the most difficult to accomplish. In part, because there's such a long history of our museums not being places that are diverse, equitable, accessible, and inclusive. And we're now in a period in our country and in many parts of the world where there's a new version of giving permission to openly express bigotry and hatred and to engage in violence against people in underrepresented communities. People of color, women, LGBTQ people, people experiencing poverty, people with disabilities, people who are not Christians. Yes, there are some colleagues within our museum community and certainly individuals beyond our community who say that the times that we are in make it impossible to carry on with our stated commitment to diversity. In response to that attitude, I want you to listen to the words of the great Muhammad Ali. Impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in the world they've been given than to explore the power they have to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. I'm proud to be in the struggle for bringing greater diversity to our museum staffs, collections, programs, and audiences, and building an inclusive environment in the museum community. I'm even proud of the fact that under the leadership of our sister president, Laura Lott, the American Alliance of Museums has been one of the leading advocates on these issues. As a result of our concerted efforts, our museum community has made progress in terms of diversity. The Sioux Nation has a saying, women hold up half the sky. Well, today, women hold up more than half of the sky in our museums, for women are now the majority of museum employees. Women are also the majority of those in leadership positions. But similar progress has not been made in terms of people of color in leadership positions in our museums. Yes, we're working on it. Indeed, 35% of new hires in US museums are people of color. We must do better on the question of racial and ethnic diversity in our museum staffs. We must do better because, well, as an Arabic saying puts it, it takes more than one flower to make a bouquet. Our efforts must also involve actualizing 
our stated commitment for greater diversity in our museums with respect to sexual orientation, gender identity, age, class, and different abilities. And so, my kinfolks, in this time of great stress and difficulty, what must we do about our stated diversity? The D E A N I. I think we must press on, press on with radically reimagining what can and should be done. And then we must do it. Our Director of Inclusion, Brother Andrew Plumley, likes to quote a line from the movie Black Panther. It's a line that lifts up the importance of working together and the beauty of equality. Drawing on an African proverb in the film, T'Challa says, in times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. That's it, that's it. In this time of crisis and beyond, our museums must, must build bridges across the range of differences that we have allowed to divide us. And of course, we must continue to build bridges into the communities of which we are a part. And so, my sisters and brothers, my siblings all, are you ready? Are you ready to turn away from doing the same old things in the same old ways? Are you ready to engage in the kind of radical imagining that can transform our museums into places that are far more amazing and full of grace than we have ever before imagined. If you are, if you are ready, then welcome to the first ever AAM virtual annual meeting. We are pleased to welcome Catherine Devine, Business Strategy Leader for Libraries and Museums at Microsoft to introduce today's keynote speaker. Good morning, everybody from uh, <clears throat> Seattle, um, where it's a lovely cloudy day as uh, probably not unexpected. Um, I'm Catherine Devine. Um, I'm the Microsoft Worldwide Education Leader for Libraries and Museums. Um, many of you will know me from my time um, in museums in New York. Certainly been in museum space for the last decade at least. I'm thrilled to be able to introduce today's keynote speaker, Anthony Salcedo, who is also my manager um, at Microsoft. Welcome, Anthony. And um, today, you know, we're delighted to have the opportunity to sponsor um, AAM, particularly in such challenging times. Uh, we're also delighted to be able to um, help provide scholarships for people to attend today who have been affected by furloughs and, uh, and layoffs and certainly going through a very challenging time, but there's probably no better time than now to be looking at how we can uh, leverage digital to further missions of organizations. So let me introduce Anthony. Anthony has a long history at Microsoft in education where he's very focused on empowering um, educators and students, inspiring students, and looking how we can use technology to achieve more and to further learning and the aims of organizations um, in this space everywhere. With that, let's uh, roll the video, Brian. And, uh, and then I, you know, really looking forward to Anthony's speech today. Thank you. We are all teachers. And we are all learners. 
We each learn in our own way. We are designing an acid rain shield for Taj Mahal. We are working on the science and archaeology behind Pompeii. What else? We are working on how we can save water. And it was really cool. We are surgeons and climate scientists. We are architects and artists. We are anything and everything we want to be. I want to be an engineer and a poet. I want to be a lawyer to help other people see reality. We all have our own challenges. Math is sometimes hard for me. I'm really bad at writing. Programs are challenging for me, which I... Sorry. But we find ways to make them opportunities. So we can see and understand. And come together to solve problems. Then it would come down this way, go through the filter. Then it would come into the rain catcher. In school. And in the world. I want to help people by breaking stereotypes, showing people that we all stand together. I would probably try and help people who aren't really confident in themselves. <laughs> I want to see the world turn into a better place for everyone. We're not waiting for tomorrow. Because we're creating a future today. Great. So with that, let's welcome um, in Anthony Celsius. Thank you, Catherine. And it is a great uh, honor to be with all of you today. Uh, it's a, a special day for museums, but a challenging time for the world. Uh, I hope all of you are staying safe and being well. Uh, and as Catherine highlighted earlier, this is a time of great learning, uh, learning as societies address with co uh, the response to COVID-19. Uh, what makes us all human and what we value most uh, in our societies. And although a ch challenging time for schools, universities, certainly library museums, I think the foundation of learning will help us not only connect to uh, our students uh, and guests, but really create a foundation for us to share globally. Uh, I have been very proud uh, and inspired by the work that's happening around the world uh, where uh, schools and institutions are sharing openly about how they're responding to this journey, uh, learning from innovations all over the world, and really building community through this uh, common struggle. Uh, there are uh, certainly challenging times ahead, but certainly opportunities as we embrace it. I want to reflect on that. I also will talk a lot about digital transformation. Uh, but I want to put it in a context for the broader dynamics um, that we've got to consider and certainly hopefully the spirit that you'll take uh, my comments today. Uh, I've been working with schools and universities primarily since uh, really early January as a rapid response to crisis uh, took place. Uh, we're learning though and we're starting to lift out and although most schools and certainly museums aren't yet opened, we have a, a path and insight of what could happen and what, frankly, we want to take from the learnings uh, over the last several months. I also want to just start by reflecting uh, on uh, this special day for museums, uh, whether finding out about it through Animal Crossing today, which is recognized in the game as International Museums Day, uh, seeing some of the amazing work going on online. I know most museums are still closed, but you would never know it based on the engagement, the activity that uh, I'm connecting to museums. I'm visiting many museums websites, seeing the work that you're doing to engage guests, to extend the borders and boundaries of your institutions. Uh, and frankly, congratulations on your leadership uh, and the what you're doing to not only keep this special day moving, but really innovating on how we can engage uh, guests uh, and uh, and create a much more boundless and boundaryless uh, uh, experience of museums uh, and really celebrating what makes museums great. I think one of the things about this time, um, special institutions, uh, special things that make us connect and human will become even more valued going forward. Uh, 
and museums have that emotional connection to me and many of you, certainly uh, many of the people in the world. And I think that won't be lost uh, in this quarantine and COVID time, but in frankly, uh, enhanced. And I think that's an important thing that we've got to keep going uh, as we embrace this next uh, chapter uh, and next phase of our efforts. Now, I reflect a little bit on digital transformation. It's a buzzword for sure. We use it in the technology field far too much. Uh, and certainly it applies to every business, every industry, every discipline uh, across how do we create new ways of doing things that we've done before? How do we extend values that we could conceive of in the past? Uh, and then how do we use our resources, our people, our facilities, uh, our expenses far more uh, nimbly and more efficiently as we go forward. This is what digital transformation is all about. But it is not about losing what makes every industry, every discipline special. Uh, one of the great things that I've seen, and frankly, the thing that makes me most happy about this tough and challenging time of tremendous tragedy and human loss of life, etc., is the impact that we've seen with the transformation with educators. Many of your parents are probably more deeply appreciating your teachers than you ever have before. What's happened is the work that was often unknown to schools and classrooms is now becoming more transparent to, to parents. And that appreciation of the role of teachers is going up in society. At the same time, technology use is part of learning as its highest point ever in human history. And what we haven't seen is technology's rise diminishing the value of educators. The opposite has been true. And for teachers who were resistant of change with technology, because in many ways they were, were fearful of their own role being diminished, what we've learned over the last several weeks is that isn't going to happen. I think that same spirit is how we have to embrace uh, museums and museum expansion with digital transformation, not changing anything about what museums value and hold special. And the experience can be different, but also enhanced in ways that don't diminish or detract from the core experience that museums have had uh, for hundreds of years. Now, I want to um, reflect on this transformation as it relates to what I see happening happening very quickly now from museums in response to COVID is building digital strategies. Uh, we've had many conversations with museum leads, IT staff, who are building a quick response to COVID, a quick response to how they're going to embrace digital once museums reopen, and really, frankly, building a resilient strategy with digital, almost a digital fire drill in many ways, where we need technology to be able to quickly be resilient to future pandemics or future challenges uh, and become more nimble where we don't disrupt the operations of the business uh, as much as we have seen over the last couple of months. But frankly, digital strategies are not only in, uh, insufficient, they're actually the wrong place to focus. What we really need to build and to embrace is a core strategy for the museum that understands the dynamics of technology. Too often we see an IT staff in a museum really understaffed and maybe underappreciated because they're not part of the core activity that the museums are doing. And that's a limitation for both your success, propelling to the future, and it often hurts the, the depth of which IT can really make a, an impact inside a museum. What we've got to do is really rethink everything about a museum in this context of digital connection and not only what capabilities museums have to extend communication and collaboration with guests, but to do a better job of thinking about how digital can improve the experiences within the museum, and more importantly, optimize efficiencies across every workload that museums deal with. And this is the shift that we've got to happen. And it's really a mindset shift. And mindset in education and certainly in industry change and in transformation digitally is the foundation that you've got to embrace. As leaders, you've got to understand, are your people seeing digital and the core experience of museum as two separate things? Do we often have the biases with regards to technology resistance and fear that may exist? And we've got to overcome that. You've got to create a, an agile, 
and optimistic experience as it relates to this transit transition and transformation. And that's what it's going to be all about. I have seen institutions struggle with this change because of isolation, because fear of the unknown, because of the, the worry about the fabric of what made classrooms, and schools and museums special in the past. And what we've got to do is shift the mindset to embrace this new normal and bring hope and energy to our people and staff. This is going to be a critical phase for all of you to consider. We've got empty museums uh, increasingly around the world, uh, but, but no shortage of opportunity going forward. I, many of you are starting to build reopening plans and re museums are starting to reopen with social distancing norms uh, in place. Uh, I know that many of your guests, society, is eager to get back to what makes us human and bring a connection to this. And I'm excited about what the future holds uh, and certainly what we can do together to learn uh, from each other. Now, I wanna give a little bit of a shift to what happens next. This is frankly a time where, really from the early uh, January phase in China, Hong Kong and areas uh, where the initial outbreak of COVID-19 happened, then moving to Italy, uh, certainly we were in a response mode critically and we did things rapidly to respond to the outbreak. We're now starting to see folks plan for the next phase of recovery and reopening of schools and museums, but an eagerness to think about what's next. How do we take the learnings over the last few months, applying to the, the needs for change in the short term, and then think about how we can accelerate the pace of transformation going forward. And really, that's going to be critical as we move. I've seen examples all around the world where the digital borders and the, the engagement is going up, just partly because people are at home, people are using digital tools to connect, to learn, uh, and to bring access to resources into homes, into the learning environment. And I will tell you, that's one of the important pivots that you've got to recognize as it relates to your role and function at museum. The digital language of learning has changed just in a span of a few months. Schools who are using technology primarily to serve classroom use, whiteboards and smart board conversion, physical tests to digital tests, physical books to digital books, most of that was in service of the boundaries of the school, the classroom uh, itself, the school itself. What we've seen is schools rapidly shift to remote learning, which has created an engagement enga uh, opportunity that was never before realized. Schools won't go back. Schools will continue to blend that learning going forward. Even when schools and classrooms reopen, this notion of being connected always, getting access to digital materials, connecting to classrooms beyond the, uh, the boundaries of a school, as well as educators participating in a lo longer and, and broader learning life is going to be critical. So how do you as a museum leader enable and leverage that reality, that new normal that exists in the, in the, the way of learning? And that also will be true in the way we deal with every industry. Increased reliance on digital engagement will be an opportunity, I think, to extend the value, the relevance of museums in every community and every society. And we're starting to see early glimpses there and I certainly want to keep that going forward. We've seen tremendous energy historically around museum engagement and Skype in the classroom. This has been a great opportunity to connect students to educators, to museum curators, to share collections in museums. And this is one of the amazing opportunities that we have going forward. Microsoft has worked to continue to extend Skype in the classrooms uh, and really engage digitally with students for, who are going on virtual field trips every day all around the world. Thank you for your support here. Uh, it's been great to see the energy and activity going on. We've also seen uh, really amazing things happen in a very quick time in schools and classrooms. I've been, as Catherine said, I've been doing this work around really my life's work of getting technology and education to work together harmoniously for the better outcomes of every student. Um, that's what I'm motivated by, what I'm driven by, and I have to say I've seen more progress really in the last few months than have happened in decades around the thinking, around the openness to change with technology and the mind shift that's happening with educators. There are a lot of things that we're learning and frankly, we're getting smarter and better every single week 
Um, but we certainly see the shift changing quick. And what we're also seeing is institutions starting to rethink what they can do digitally and the value of the human interaction and connection. I'm hopeful the school time where students and, and educators are engaged is gonna be far more interactive, far more purpose-driven on what is really the role of the building, the materials in the building, and the human collaboration and connection possibilities of the school. And then leverage the rest digitally. So have a great blended model where students are working in isolation or working with digital tools at home or in the libraries and buses, et cetera. And then when we're together with each other, we leverage that more mindfully. And that's the same example that you can take in museums. When you're in front of a beautiful painting or sculpture or fossil or uh, experience, what is unique to that engagement? And then how do I extend in different ways beyond? And certainly museums who are really showing a fraction of their collection to guests can have an opportunity to open up their collection digitally in much different ways using this blended modality as we go forward. We're gonna learn from schools and universities. And for those of you uh, who are curious, lean in to your school leaders, university leaders on how they're managing the change, how they're coping and planning to go back in the future. I think this partnership is gonna be critical with museums uh, as we move ahead. Now, uh, the Japanese word for crisis, I think really reflects the reality that we're seeing. Uh, it's a combination of the word danger and the word opportunity. And certainly we have deep respect for the, the human uh, loss of life and the human reality of COVID-19. Uh, at Microsoft, our first goal and first uh, responsibility was to keep our employees safe and do everything to help first responders get access to the technology they needed to be effective. Uh, certainly we recognize we're not out of any uh, danger period. Certainly as uh, the world starts to reopen in a cautious way, that's going to be critical top of mind. But we also have to understand where we can learn and build and grow as society uh, in our healthcare systems as first responders respond more rapidly to the learning that we've had uh, in the last several months to be more resilient and more effective as we go forward. This is the way in which we think uh, we've got to embrace the change. And we see excitement on the future from museum leaders who are thinking the right. There's certainly things that we're gonna see in uh, museums in the near term. Uh, understanding the learnings from other businesses around co contest payments, uh, the dynamics of timed entries in terms of how do we think about social distancing uh, around uh, the way in which we keep capacities limited and mindful in museums. Obviously online ticketing, uh, the removal of the interactive elements of touch screens and moving those to mobile devices that people are walking your hands. That opens up opportunities as well. Uh, these are technology things, frankly, that have all been happening within museums already. We've seen examples of museums moving out of their touch screens that were dated and ugly in many ways and using much more of an interactive experience on the phone that can not only track position in the museum actively, but also provide a much more interesting opportunity to perhaps do uh, scavenger hunts with museum collections, make connections on phones to, to other pieces that uh, a guest has viewed. There's ways in which you can take, hey, the removal of an interactive element with a touchscreen and really open up a canvas of broader discovery and opportunities for curators and museum leaders to really think about much more engaging interactive experiences and then follow up on those experiences with an at home or beyond museum experience that keep guests engaged. All of these technologies have been going on. We have partners uh, and experience that many of you are using already. We'll see an acceleration in the short term as we prepare for uh, the back, uh, reopening of museums broadly. But then in addition to those short term opportunities and frankly, all of these build on uh, if you're doing it the right way, the technology foundation that you're going to set in place as it relates to cloud technologies, identity and security, but really require a much broader business understanding and a holistic set of transformation elements to really think about these digital channels. How do we engage more people? How do we shift the model of fundraising when we're going to be looking at a much broader canvas of engaged people? Do we have subscription elements that replace sort of museum memberships 
that can keep digital content flowing and really open up more people? Can we think differently about business models with regards to institutional engagement, working with schools and universities? There are many, many ways in which I think the next several months and years will evolve the pace of digital transformation that frankly was already on course. I think we've just seen an acceleration uh, in a COVID-19 reality. Now, Microsoft has thought through the ways in which we can bring these things together. How do we bring operational efficiencies, help you expand and reach larger audiences, and then really embrace business models that are, are new and really impossible with the world of technology. Uh, these are things that I think are foundational to every industry that is thinking about digital transformation to achieve their mission. And certainly these are the three really buckets that you should be constantly thinking about and making sure that you're not overbalanced on one or another. Uh, many times we see the response to technology focus largely about this digital audience capture and really extending content collections beyond museum. Uh, and that's great, but we've got to make sure that those other elements are, are balanced appropriately. Now to help with that, Microsoft has built on work that we've been doing with schools and universities for many, many years really establishing a, a, a foundation to think through the elements of change that will be required with institutions. Uh, we've learned through universities and, and schools on their transformation that it's helpful to see the elements of change connected and important for you to understand that because increasingly technology will be connected across these experiences. Whether you're thinking about um, visitor experience or discovery of collections, the reality of now with technology that's built around cloud, that's built around identity and insight, it's powered by new technology capabilities. It's not only nice to think about these things connected, if you do not think about everything that you're doing from a technology perspective in concert, you're gonna miss opportunity for change and an opportunity to really transform new services going forward. We've got to think about everything that we're doing. Now, one of the exciting things that's happening is the advanced discovery with the power of AI. This is not only helping us do a better job of researching collections, creating engaging experiences, but helping audiences get access to uh, discover collections and really get insight throughout a museum's collection that was very difficult to do in the past. We're seeing the power of AI bring digital archives to life in many ways. Uh, there are examples of museums who are starting on a journey to take their uh, previously, uh, you know, meta-tag light collections, use the power of computer vision AI to understand context and relevance between collections to help guests get really not only great index and searchable response, but have ability to see connections between painters and studies uh, on, on various things with human history, response to historical times, a real great connections and really building a branching thread to really hope researchers, students, visitors can really experience collections in new ways. And Reichs and the Met and certainly Cleveland Museum of Art are really early leaders here, really thinking about the power of AI to make their digital collections uh, more accessible, more engaging. We're seeing examples of enhanced visitor experience. Many of you are already doing this and really hard at work here uh, as a response to COVID-19 uh, reopening of museums, really thinking about how do you uh, engage uh, not only visitors digitally, but really engage digitors uh, for a much more connected uh, and much more um, uh, uh, engaged uh, part of a museum experience. Certainly, uh, dynamic operations is an area that often is uh, the least sexy, maybe it's the least um, uh, uh, excitement on a museum IT uh, plan as well, uh, but it's super critical. It's super important that we do this. Now, for your museum staff now, you're starting to feel the need for technology like this, like what we're doing now to help us with collaboration. We have many examples of museums leveraging tools like Microsoft Teams, to collaborate like we're doing today, uh, where we are keeping the work that's going on in the museum every day together and we're moving forward in new ways. Hopefully this will become a much more established way to collaborate across museums anyway, leveraging productivity experiences and frankly investments that many museums have made. Many museums already have technologies to do collaboration in a better way than they've done it in the past without uh, really adding any expense. And this is something that we hope continue as we move forward. 
Uh, certainly, um, the last piece, and certainly is going to be the short term need for focus, is making sure that we have intelligent environments that not only understand future safety, but use those safety tools to monitor guest counts, uh, do, ensure proper spacing, et cetera. So there are many, many areas of change, many areas that Microsoft is here to help serve. Uh, but I really want to end with a, just a core statement where I began. We're focused on these changes for the betterment of society, the betterment of uh, our cultures uh, and the way, work that we're doing with schools and students. And as you embrace this transformation digitally, don't forget that for your staff, for your guests, the transformation is all about people. No school or university is embracing a digital transformation. They're embracing a people transformation. It's important for you to do that. And I thank you for the work that you're doing as leaders to help your people uh, and help all of us in society experience your great institutions once again. And I'm looking forward to my visits uh, once uh, this uh, tragedy uh, subsides. So thank you very much for your leadership. And I look forward to uh, maybe a couple of questions to help. Great, thanks so much, Anthony. A um, couple of questions, a um, couple of comments that I think might be really interesting to the audience. Um, we, you talked about mindset change, and you know something that I've often talked about is that technology is actually the easiest piece of this. What is actually the most difficult piece is how to achieve that cultural change, how to achieve that mindset change um, in organizations. From your experience with um, schools and uh, universities and now increasingly museums, do you have any sort of, you know, sort of top of mind suggestions about, um, you know, how to think about that as a cultural change in an organization? Yeah, it's, it's super important. I think the first thing to do is recognize the, the shift, right? So recognize that mindset is going to be important, frankly, more important than technology. In many ways, technology has gotten easier. It's cheaper, it's easier to do with cloud. You don't have to buy servers and bring in and et cetera. So put that energy around people in transition. Uh, you know, we often see universities trying to build a data-driven decision-making model when they don't recognize that faculty aren't data-driven. And they've got to think about ways in which that they can um, bring that shift in mindset in place. Um, what you want to start to do, though, is in many ways, like, you know, many of us are not going to airports any longer, uh, but many of you have done this inside construction projects go ongoing in collection areas in museums. Uh, you know, hey, you know, apologize for the, for the construction. There's a great exhibit coming soon. There's this promise of uh, inconvenience in the short term or a journey to walk further in the short term to get to a better future. We've got to think about that as well with regards to technology transformation. In many ways, your staff are going to say, why do we have to do this extra thing? Or why do we have to now swipe our badges when we walk into a room? And then you've got to sell that vision of what change can be enabled. And I think that balance of short term reality as well as a longer term vision is often not connected to many individuals. They see technology as encroaching in various ways that don't seem organic, don't seem natural to the flow of the museum. You've got to do a better job of, of selling that vision and really building the vision. We often see in institutions, in education institutions, museums, reacting with technology in small bits. We're executing on what we can deliver, what we can deploy, what we can buy, et cetera. And there isn't really a connection to the longer term roadmap of change. We've got to do it the other way. Start with that mountaintop. What do you think the future looks like in 50 years? And then build back with technology decisions in the short term versus the other way around. And you'll often, you'll often build more sustainable, more efficient, uh, and technology that reflects the mindset that you want to deliver as it relates to your mu museum vision and purpose. And I think that's the way I would do it. Uh, but it, it has to start by leaders, frankly. Uh, leaders who bring that energy, believe it authentically, uh, and sell it with transparency across the institution. Yeah. Great. Thanks. We're getting a question around, uh, will we make the PowerPoint available? So yes, um, we absolutely will. Um, but also a question around um, the impact of education on families in the COVID situation. So we've, we've always had a focus sure. on educators and students, but how are we thinking about family and teaching in place in, in homes? Um, how are we thinking about those kind of models? It's a great question. And frankly, um, you know, when learning comes home, you know, it now becomes more important than ever to ensure parents are included. 
Um, you know, we, we learned this really the hard way where parents were unsure of what to do, how to help their children. Uh, we spent a lot of time building parent guides, both on how to keep students safe, how to engage themselves in their digital learning environments that the students were using, their children were using. And then we also started to phase in experiences that parents can do with their children uh, that are both digital and, and physical, frankly. We don't want to over uh, pivot. Uh, one of the things we've been very mindful on is how do parents uh, really monitor screen time so students are learning and experiencing different things versus just staying connected to schools uh, via, via technology. So we've, we've been thinking through that with parent engagement. Uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity for us uh, to bring parents into their students and their children's digital lives in a better way, uh, as well as provide much more insight of the learning journey to parents. One of the great things that technology can do is help personalized learning. The more opportunity that students are having to use technology during the learning phases beyond the school, the more data and insight that we can get to help personalize that journey, provide insight to parents on some progress, uh, share great examples of, of their children's learning experiences to parents. So I think that we've got to partner with parents, use these digital tools to help enable parents to be, um, you know, uh, better uh, educators or digital to, uh, supporters. But the other reality is we can't overburden parents. We've gotten a lot of feedback for schools have relied on parents to do too much of the teaching and learning uh, experiences for students during this time. We've got to be mindful of that as we go forward. Uh, parents are getting overworked across their uh, daily stressful job working remotely, but also teaching uh, in their homes. And we've got to be more mindful of that. But I have seen tremendous progress uh, increased partnerships with schools, and I'm hopeful parents will stay as engaged as they are now going forward post-COVID. Yeah, great. Um, one last question before we wrap up. Um, diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion are very substantial topics on many um, sectors, but particularly in the museum sector. Um, you know, with this and your definition around the idea of crisis being an opportunity, um, I'm really interested in this idea that the opportunity here is about digital or technology actually increasing accessibility, um, as well as um, equity and inclusion, about being able to use digital to go outside the museum and and uh, and reach more people. Are you seeing something similar in um, in schools? Well, certainly, this is one of the great opportunities for technology. There are many people who just do not have the luxury of visiting your museum. Um, and certainly, there may be local museums that people can go to, um, but many cannot. Uh, I, I grew up in the Bronx, and I, I was fortunate to have the ability to visit New York City museums uh, that felt a, a, a world away, frankly, just on a train ride five miles away. It felt a world away for me growing up uh, in the inner city of the Bronx. Um, and I had no idea of the power and potential of other museums globally. I never, um, other museums were, were just seen in movies um, and experienced in books, but had no opportunity and no real potential to visit. That's changed. Uh, I can see uh, experience, be part of museums, feel like I can be a member of museums far beyond the borders of where I live uh, and my likelihood or, or means to visit. That's something that you've got to think of. Schools are dealing with that. Now, schools are also dealing with other challenges. Uh, connectivity and access to devices has been a huge equity gap for schools. Uh, but the reality, the bigger gap has been access to quality educators and learning materials. So you can say, well, now that we've, we've got access to digital, we've got access to solve that problem. So what we've been doing is providing low cost devices, working with hardware manufacturers to lower the entry points of devices, and then building more blended reality, whether uh, experience can be done on cell phones or even lightweight phones that aren't even smart, uh, bringing um, shared experiences across the collective, but really thinking about that. The other thing that we um, have been recognizing, in addition to technology access for equity, it's the inclusion reality that technology can help with accessibility, whether it's anything from translation services to help uh, collections that would be often in, and tools that were often in, in local language become more accessible because the power of subtitling and online translation, uh, the ability for us to use digital tools to help with accessible needs, 
we're opening up opportunities and access to museums by using the tools of technology with accessibility as well. So we think about this inclusion dynamic, both on equity, but also with accessibility. It's an area that we certainly would love to talk more about, uh, but we do see examples happening in the world of education that will sustain going forward. Right. Well, thanks so much, Anthony. Let's wrap up there. Just one last thing that I forgot to mention at the beginning is, of course, Microsoft is, is offering um, a $5 gift card from the Microsoft Store. Um, and this people it'll be randomly drawn from people who attended the keynote today. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to have us and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. We will um, have a booth and, um, and we're also running many more sessions. So thank you. Bye.